Hello, welcome along to a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly Podcast. My name's Dan, thank you for listening. This is the show where we search and we scour space to try and uncover some of the secrets that are lurking inside. And there's quite a big space for us to look at in space, so we better get cracking, don't you say? And now this week we'll take a look at one of the smallest but deadliest things that's lurking under the sea. Uh, I'll put a little warning out with this one, actually. Uh, It causes, I reckon, one of the most terrifying things, things related to sickness and symptoms uh, that I've ever heard. Get ready for that, it's in a little bit. Uh, Also, we'll talk about where all the sharks are going in the sea, and we'll answer some of your questions today. They're on why you can't sleep when you're excited, what the lightest solid material ever is, and we'll look at what happens if the sun would just disappear. That's on the way. Your questions answered on the Fun Kids Science Weekly. First, uh, let's catch up with two of our alien mates who are trying to get back home. This is NNG. NNG's Energy Challenge. Now, getting us back to Zog is a seriously big problem, right? Right, Dan. Gonna need a seriously big solution. Ginormous. I'm so homesick. <laughs> all right, all right, calm down. You're wasting energy there. He, do you get it? Not funny. So what's the ginormous solution to our ginormous problem? Well, what were some of the ginormous animals that lived on Earth? Dinosaurs. <laughs> you got it. Well, energy can be made from dead dinosaurs, animals and plants that lived millions of years ago. Dead dinosaurs? That's seriously gross. And isn't it kind of rude? I mean, they died. That's kind of sad. You want to burn them up so we can put them in our fuel tank? Disrespectful! Don't get upset. They've been dead for millions of years. When they died, the remains were buried under many layers of rock and soil. Over time, the tremendous heat and pressure created by these layers turned the animal and plant matter into oil and natural gas. That's even worse! Yuck! I bet it smells horrible! Dinosaur gas! Calm down. Once natural gas has been processed ready for use, well, it doesn't smell of anything much. In fact, humans add a special smell to it, so that it's easy to smell if there's a leak. What does it smell like? And not nice. Is it worse than dung from the Zogian smog? Yeah. Nothing's that bad. It smells a bit like eggs. And if humans get a whiff of that, they know they need to call a gas company. Otherwise, well, you get the idea. Gas is found deep underground in many parts of the Earth. The UK has its very own source in the North Sea, although that gas only gives them about half the amount they need. So where does the rest come from? They buy it from other countries. Some of it is sent in pipes across Europe. It even gets here by ship. Once it's cleaned up, it could be used to create electricity in power stations. Or it might be sent directly into homes to heat boilers or cook food. But would it run out one day? Well, it all depends. If humans try not to waste this stuff, it might last another couple of hundred years. Um, I don't want to be rude, but it seems like humans aren't always particularly good at saving energy. True, true. And if the amount they use increases, which could easily happen with a growing population, well, maybe it will last less than 100 years. And there's another problem. The trouble is, to get us back to Zog, we'd need to use, um, well, pretty much all their gas in one go. And so their supply would only last how long? Uh, I'll figure it out. Hang on. Um, about, uh, more or less, rounding up, carrying the one. Another six and a half minutes. I don't think they'd bank us for that. Probably a bit rude. Well, we'll have to find another kind of energy. Oh, hang on. Watch out. Looks like we're going to fuse, G. Here it comes. Whoopee! I love a bit of fusion. Here it comes. Woohoo! NNG's Energy Challenge with support from National Grid. Find out more online at funkitslive.com slash energy. It's question time on the show. Uh, I love this more than anything else on the Fun Kids Science Weekly. And I've even got a feature named after me, Dangerous Dan. It's on the way, but I love this more. It's where I get to answer the science questions that you leave as a review over on Apple Podcasts. William's got in touch. He says he's up writing this question on Christmas Eve. Uh, I'm about a month late, William. Sorry. Um, But William, you ask, why can't you sleep on Christmas Eve? Um, Because you're really excited. 
What, why do you stay up for hours and you just can't drop off? I think because we're a month away from Christmas, uh, I'll take that as generally why you can't sleep when you're excited about something, William, if that's all right with you. Uh, it's all about two hormones. You see, excitement and stress makes your body produce the hormones adrenaline and cortisol. Uh, now, that's what you also make when you play sport or when you're in a dangerous situation when you're in fight or flight mode, it kind of gets your body ready to do something. It increases your blood pressure, it increases your heart rate as well, and it makes you be awake and be aware of what's happening. That's why you can't sleep when you're excited, uh, because of the adrenaline and the cortisol. Thank you for that, William. Uh, this is from Isaac the Newton, which is one of the favourite names I think we have ever been sent in, who asks, uh, what's the lightest solid material ever? That, that'll be graphene aerogel. Isaac the Newton. Uh, I like this question because it's something that I've never heard of before. Graphene aerogel. It, it weighs just 0.16 milligrams per cubic centimetre. It's lighter than a feather, pretty much. It's made in China. Now, it's made by mixing a special gel with a gas. And uh, one of these types has been nicknamed frozen smoke. Uh, and what's the point? What's the point in making something so light, you ask? I know I can hear you. Uh, well, it's scientists think that it could help make lighter, more efficiently powered batteries, which could really help with the future of electric cars. The incredible thing about graphene aerogel as well, it can balance on a flower without damaging any of the petals. Thank you for that, Isaac the Newton. Brilliant name. Uh, and lastly, with questions today, uh, an, an incredible question. Uh, we've all wondered this, and no one's ever asked me. Milo, who is 10 years old, wants to know what would happen if the sun disappeared. Now, I can give you the short answer, or the slightly longer answer. The short answer, Milo, we'd have a very bad time. The longer answer, well, the first thing that would happen is the Earth would just fly, it would career in a straight line across space, because the sun's gravity locks the planets in orbit, so no sun means no gravity, really, from the sun, nothing for us to orbit around, so we would just fly off in a straight line. Now, after about eight minutes, everything would go dark, there'd be no sunlight, because it takes eight minutes for sunlight to reach Earth, so after that time, it'll be gone. All the plants would then die, because they would need sunlight for photosynthesis, which is how they live. Uh, within a week, the temperature would drop below zero degrees Fahrenheit, the oceans would freeze within a year, and only life forms that use the heat of the Earth's core would be able to stay alive, which ain't humans, Milo. So we wouldn't last that long if the sun disappeared. We'd have quite a bad time of it, I reckon. Uh, thanks for the question. If you've got something sciencey that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it as a review for us over on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. I'm going to try and answer a question that has bugged me for ages. It's a weird one, but it's annoying me. It's all about dogs. Why do dogs, dogs that can go off and do their own thing, that have all the tools available to hunt their own food, why are they obedient to humans? Why do they let themselves be our pets? Well, Maria Lahtinen is a scientist from the Finnish Food Authority, and she might have an answer. Maria, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, this study sounds pretty amazing, this research. What was the first idea you had that maybe there might be an answer with what you were looking at? Well, first I've studied more the humans than the dogs. And I think I came up with this idea while looking at how people uh, survive in the Arctic winters. And uh, there has been a lot of studies on this. And it's typically that they have a lot of animal-based items in their food. So I started to, to join the two questions together, how the dogs were domesticated and how people coped in the cold, harsh environment. Because um, it's often that people living in the north, they really go for having a very high fat diet. And they are not so much interested on the meat part. So we actually figure out that this meat could have been eat could have been given to the early dogs instead of actually throwing it away. And we made some calculation, and it really looks like that there was leftover meat bits for the early dogs. So they're they're eating the leftover meat. 
why do they keep coming back? Why do they allow themselves to be domesticated? Is it so? Is it because they need something that's in the meat, or is it just because it's any food? Well, uh, we know that uh, people really love pets, and it's not only nowadays, but it was also in the past. So it's people also actually value of having dog friends, not only that they would be beneficial because dogs were the first animal to be domesticated. So there was no idea what it could be like. So I don't, or we don't think that it was done on purpose, that dogs, people didn't decide to, to tame their dog, tame their wolves. They, they became friends and it led to domestication. What's in it for the dog, Maria? Um, in the research, um, it's all about excess protein. Why would the dogs want that to allow themselves to be domesticated? Well, it's yummy. They would get, they would be fed. They would get also shelter from humans, and they would because because wolves they they live in packs. So it must be so that also the early dogs felt to be part of the human pack. Now, when this first happened, I know that you're quite into the food side of things, but thousands and thousands of years ago, when humans first started to domesticate dogs, how different were those dogs to the dogs that we might have in our houses right now? What do you know about that? Well, um, there has been a lot of studies on the early dog fossils. Uh, It all happened during the last ice age, And uh, so most of Europe and Asia were much colder than today. And we know that the the dogs became smaller and it's likely that they were less aggressive than their um, ancestry wolves. There are all sorts of characteristics that normally take place when an animal becomes domesticated, for example, uh, they become more colorful. They are more tame and more sociable towards humans. And this process was very long, so it didn't have it didn't happen in one place because uh, after the ice melted away and uh, people started farming, the, also the use of the dogs changed and the diet of the dog changed and the dogs changed and and they started to to vary in very many forms. So it's not not only the very initial states when when something happens to to the dogs or the humans dog relationship. So this is pretty much evolution almost at work, isn't it, Maria? That these these dogs who need quite a lot of the food that we can't eat loads of, they take that food it allows them to thrive and su- and survive, and to do that, they cozy up to us humans. Yes, more or less so. But we also think that it's uh, it was important in this process that dogs are beneficial for humans in many other ways, just as than being companion. Uh, because after the dog starts to behave domestic, like they can be used for hunting aid or pulling a sledge or or they keep you warm during the winter they 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 guard your camp they are very useful in many ways so these 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 benefits kept the dead dog domestication process ongoing do you have a dog maria unfortunately i don't have a dog i had a cat who just recently passed away oh i'm so sorry to hear that maria Thank um you. Well, listen, very quickly, lastly, up in Finland, while we're talking about food and you're a, you know, you're a food and diet expert, I know very little about Finnish cuisine. Um, if I were to make a stop in Helsinki, what, what would you tell me to sample? What's a, a, a classic Finnish meal? Well, I would say something fish and uh, vegetables. I think the ingredients in the traditional Finnish cooking and British cooking are very similar. It's just how things were uh, things were done slightly differently. But I think during the past thirty years, the cuisine has changed radically. That you can find all type of food in Finland, 
from various parts of the world, so people don't no longer eat what's the d- traditional local diet like. And, and here's one last question. This is not to do with dogs at all. I'm just interested. Um, in the UK and uh, America, particularly, the rising ple- the rise in people being vegetarians and people being vegans and plant based is really taken off. When you get to to colder places, places further north like Finland, and um, is is it becoming popular there? People not uh, not eating meat, or do you find that you need meat? You need the fat to keep yourselves going through harsher cold weather. No, I think it's increasingly coming popular here as well, and and um, because we no longer have to survive, we can decide what to eat. So we don't have to grow our own uh, food any anymore. So so then it becomes more of an option what to eat rather than what you have to eat, and it's 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 only the like hunter gatherers or pre industrial people who actually have to eat what they can but nowadays we can actually make the decision of not eating something that's very harmful for our planet. Amazing. Maria Lahtinen, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Um we love chatting about dogs. For today's Dangerous Dan, we're headed under the sea to take a look at the Irakanji jellyfish. They're an extremely venomous species of box jellyfish uh, who float around the warm waters of Australia. Now, they're one of the smallest, but one of the most deadly jellyfish in the world. It makes you wonder, how can something so tiny be so harmful? Now, the thing about the Irukandji is that how you feel after you're stung, it doesn't just hurt, but it's bizarrely strange as well. Now you get sick. You get headache, you get cramping, which is what you'd expect. But also you get this weird sensation that people call an impending sense of doom. I told you, it's terrifying. You feel like that's it. You feel like your life's not worth living, that it's over. Something that this jellyfish has has put into your body makes you feel like there's no point in you living anymore. I mean, you feel very, very low. But that's all in your head. It's really bizarre that there's a lot of pain in your body as well. It gives your back a pain that's like an electric drill jabbing into you. You're sick for 12 hours straight. You're so weak you could barely move. And again, I'll say it one more time for you. There's that impending sense of doom. It's all because of the Irukandji jellyfish of the Australian waters. Its head, its bell, is just one inch long. Yet it's one of the most deadly, painful things in the ocean. Right, let's have a look at how things are working inside your body right now. This is Professor Hallux. Hallux's Physiology Fix-Up. Three, two, one, go! Incredible. A new world record smidgen. Look, Nanobot, I really think I've cracked a way to improve on the body's sensory system. Using... A bird? Not just any bird. This prize-winning miniature carrier pigeon. Called Smidgen? That's his name, yes. Don't wear it out. You think that Smidgen, the prize-winning miniature carrier pigeon, can do the job of the human body senses? Sight, touch, smell, all of that? Well, I know this sounds controversial, but when you get down to it, the sensory system is all about carrying messages around and doing it quickly. Carrying messages is what Smidgen's famous for. But the sensory system is able to do all those jobs because of the way the sense organs are constructed and the way they work with other parts of the body. I don't think you can just strap something to a bird's leg and hope for the best. Of course I'm not going to strap anything to a bird's leg. Well, that's a relief. Because I've made him a teeny tiny rucksack. See? Well, let's see how he matches up. Loading physiology file. Sensory system job one, sight. The eye contains a lens which bends and filters the light and sends it to the brain over a special optic nerve. Physiology fail. You see, our sensory system isn't just about carrying information to the brain, it's packaging it up in ways the brain will be able to understand. Might need a bigger rucksack, smidgen. Sensory system job two, sound. The ear is designed in such a way that the hairs in the ear change vibrations into an electrical signal that the brain can understand and interpret as the sounds we hear. 
physiology fail. However clever Smidgen is, I don't think he can carry vibrations. I could hit him with a tuning fork. I'm joking. All right, what's next? Sensory system, job three, taste. Tongues are covered with taste buds which pick up chemical messages from food. Nerves are located at the base of the taste buds which send their information to the brain. Physiology fail. Hmm. Smidgen's talents don't extend to chemistry. Sensory system, job four, smell. Mucous membranes located within the nose relay messages to the brain. Physiology fail. Disappointing that you're losing out to mucus, Smidge. <coughs> Sensory system, job five, touch. Skin contains nerve endings that send information to the brain. Cold, heat, contact and pain are four different types of sensations observed through skin. Physiology fail. All right. Even the world's fastest miniature pigeon is no match for our sensory system. Sorry, Smidgen. But Smidgen is great at being a pigeon. Living things have evolved over thousands of years to be just right at doing the jobs they have to do. If you compare your eyes with Smidgen's, you'll see some things are the same, but other things are different. Yes, Smidgen's eyes are on the side of his head and ours are on the front. That's because pigeons are more likely to be hunted, so they need to have a wide field of vision. Humans are more likely to be the hunter. Our eyes are better equipped to focus in to find our prey. And physiology is certainly fundamental to that. Even Smidgen agrees. Alex's Physiology Fixer, with support from the Physiological Society. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash Halux. It's time for this week's Science in the News. Scientists say sharks are disappearing from the oceans at an alarming rate. Shark numbers found in open seas have dropped by almost three quarters in the last 50 years. They're being overfished. And experts say a- urgent action is needed to try and save the shark. Now, you might think sharks are quite terrifying. Maybe this isn't that important. But we've spoken so much in the show about the ecosystem. Now, if you take sharks out of that, that would have a massive impact on everything else that's happening in the ocean. Uh, also, staying with animals, experts are using satellite images to count elephants from space. Not in space, from space. 5,000 square kilometres of habitat can be combed and searched on a single day. The pictures that they're looking at come from 600 kilometres in the sky, and it lets the scientists know where the elephants are, how many there are, and what they're up to, which is brilliant news when there's loads of poachers about. And finally, archaeologists have found the world's oldest known cave painting of an animal. It is in Indonesia. It's a wild pig believed to be drawn uh, 45,500 years ago, and it gives the earliest evidence that humans had settled in that region. And that is it for the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for listening. If you've got a science question, uh, and they were brilliant today, if you can top those, make sure you send it over. Leave it as a review wherever you are in the world on Apple Podcasts. Uh, if you don't listen on Apple, if you're on Spotify, Google, or any other of the podcast places, uh, just drop me a line, send an email to me over at funkidslive.com. Uh, click on Dan. Uh, email me through there Uh, while you're at funkidslive.com it's one of the best places that you can hear all of our podcasts that we make we've got loads there we've got loads on apple loads wherever you're listening to podcasts and on the free fun kids app as well and fun kids are a children's radio station from the uk you can hear us all over the country on your dearby digital radio on the free fun kids app and at funkidslive.com